let's have a look at the margin requirements that uh, are specified per contract and every contract will be different so what I've done is I've shown the buyer and the seller being a party to the contract the contract has its own margin specifications which I've called X whatever they happen to be that's referred to as the initial margin both the buyer and the seller post X now here's the seller's account the margin is simply just segregated it doesn't change hands here's the seller's account the margin again is just segregated in the account in other words it's restricted funds they can't touch it it's the margin they have to post in their own accounts so when they enter a futures contract no money changes hands it's just the margin specification has to be met in each of these accounts 0.75x whatever x is take three quarters of it that's called the maintenance margin so that if the margin value, if the value of the account drops in their account and eventually hits 0.75, then they have to bring the margin back up to the initial margin. They have to deposit some funds into their account to bring it back up to the initial margin. So let's have an example. And what we're going to show is, is a concept in futures market called marked to market. Marked to market so you can see how the profit and loss works on a futures contract it's marked sorry marked to market it is called daily settlement or referred to as the daily settlement so let's see how that works on day one the futures contract is up a hundred dollars well the buyer has a long position recall and the seller has a short position so if the contract is up a hundred the buyer is up a hundred so the buyer will have X in their account plus $100. The seller will have X minus $100. On day two, the contract is up another $100. So on day two, the buyer will have X plus $200. The seller will have X minus $200. On day three, the contract falls $600. The seller's account will have a total of X minus $400. $600 down, the $200 disappears, plus another $400, whereas the seller will now have a total of X plus $400. The key concept in marked to market is that whatever time the contract settles at, whatever the price is, the difference between that price and the previous close will determine whether the contract is up or down for the day. If it's up, the money leaves the seller's account and finds its way into the buyer's account. If it's down for the day, the money leaves the buyer's account and finds its way into the seller's account. This is important. Cash changes hands daily. Daily settlement. That's what that means. This is for an exchange-traded contract. That's why it's a futures. It's called futures. A forward contract is what this is, but we call it a futures when it's exchange-traded daily settlement is an exchange traded specification margin calls must be met by contract close that day now this sets up a bit of a difficulty if you do not have funds with your broker in multiple accounts let's say but let's say you have one account and there's a margin call on it there is no way to meet the call that day you cannot get money into your trading account that fast. Even if you initiate a transfer from your bank first thing in the morning to your trading account, knowing that you're going to need the margin call, it takes sometimes two, three, four days for it to clear through all the proper channels before it hits your account. You got to settle up that day. So chances are, if you get a margin call, your closing positions. You're not meeting the margin call. You're not going to be able to meet the margin call unless you have another account or other accounts with that broker where you can say, well, look, I have securities in this other account. Use that as collateral against this and I'll get you some money in. Or that you're large enough and big enough. You have a relationship with a bank that your broker knows about and is willing to do it for you. Other than that, you cannot meet a margin call by the close of the day unless you already have the money in place to meet it. But if you have to get it in there, that's not going to happen. You're closing positions. 
The initial margin, however, need not be cash. It can be treasuries. You'll get 90% of whatever the value. So if you have $100,000 in treasuries, you have 90,000 of margin that you can use. It could be stocks. Anywhere from 50% to 70% of the value of the stock. Now, some stocks qualify for uh, a higher amount of margin ability because they represent stocks that are very, very low in volatility, very small price movements from day to day. So the broker is willing to go to 70% on some of those, but generally 50%. So you don't. So even if you have uh, a, a brokerage account and it's got uh, a bunch of dividend-paying stocks in there, you, there's the value of those are still available to post as collateral against margin. So that rather than just having cash sitting there doing nothing, earning broker interest, it could be earn, it could be doing something else. So these are very important points to remember. Margin calls are almost are almost always closing calls. In other words, you get a margin call, it's, you either have to close your position or, as I'll show you in later chapters, reduce the risk of the open position by taking another position in another contract that reduces the risk, typically an option, an option on the futures contract. So with everything here, we can make a statement that credit risk is equal or near equal to zero for any buyer or seller because... Margin requirements reduce counterparty risk. Number two, the clearinghouse is counterparty to all contracts and the clearinghouse is never defaulted on anybody. And number three, being that everything is marked to market, in the worst case scenario, if there were a default, the worst that could happen is you would be out one day's profit. The worst that could happen. So you have to settle up every day. The, the, counterpart, the clearinghouse is counterparty and the margin requirements basically means that credit, I'm not going to say it's equal to zero, it's near equal to zero. To see why it's not equal to zero, um, do some research on what happened when the Swiss National Bank removed the peg on the Swiss franc to the euro. Uh, there are some companies that actually went under simply because the client's uh, margin was not enough to meet the massive losses that accrued. And if you look at one of the biggest currency traders in the U.S., retail currency trader, FXCM, uh, they needed a bailout. They needed to, to, to be bought out by another company to cover those losses. They were $400 million down. That was it. They were done. Uh, so they had to sell a major part of themselves just to stay in business. So I'm not going to say that it's zero because of these things. I'm not about to say zero, but near zero because of all of these things. Well, up to this point, and the title of the chapter uh, actually is the mechanics of futures markets. So we haven't really talked about OTC because that's not a futures market. Uh, it's not exchange traded. It's dealer uh, traded. Uh, the OTC market, they're not standardized. They're customizable. Uh, and not marked to market. We have what is called last day settlement on forwards. And so that brings up counterparty risk. Well, not so much anymore. And it's worth talking about in this chapter because this OTC market is moving towards this type of model. Having a central counterparty where the buyer and the seller are now dealing with a central counterparty who is the counterparty to both the buyer and and the seller, both post initial margin. And this has to happen whenever possible. Uh, more so for financial institutions, almost absolutely for financial institutions. Well, what does this mean whenever possible? Dodd-Frank Act sets out this term. In all sufficiently liquid and standardized contracts must move to a central counterparty. Sufficiently liquid and standardized contracts must move to the central counterpart. So that's what it means whenever possible. So when we're dealing with contracts that are fairly standardized, they're fairly obvious. A lot of the currency contracts are, are such that they're sufficiently liquid and standardized that they can move to a central counterparty. If not, we still have what is called bilateral clearing, where the buyer and the seller deal with each other, and often they post collateral. But... As of 2012, because of Dodd-Frank, margin must be posted as well. And this is especially so between financial institutions. Here's why. Remember, 
These are free to enter. No money changes hands. So if no money changes hands in the OTC market, in any market, and in the OTC market, if we're looking at last day settlement and there's no mark to market, I don't have to worry about having the money on hand today in case something goes wrong. So if I don't have to post margin, I'm going to open up contracts everywhere because I think I'm right. Everybody thinks they're right. That's why they do it. But if I have to post margin, I'm eventually going to run out of money. I'm eventually going to say, well, I, I'm fully margined right now. I don't have anything else to post as collateral and I have no more margin. It will bring down the level of leverage that was used. When you look at uh, uh, companies using 30 and 40 to 1 leverage, you get a 2 or 3% move in asset prices. That company's gone. Well, this is not intended well, I shouldn't say it's not intended. It's not going to have the effect of completely eliminating that type of risk, but it's certainly going to slow it down, and it's certainly going to minimize it and contain it somewhat. So it's worth looking at, uh, at this right now, even though we're talking about the mechanics of futures markets, being that the OTC market is moving towards a future-style exchange market, uh, it's worth having a look at.